All right. Welcome back to Financial Clarity for Doctors, everyone. I'm Corey Janoff, joined as always by Rochelle Vanderzanden. Hello. And today we're going to have some fun and make some predictions for the future because everyone likes to make predictions and or read predictions of other people they deem to be knowledgeable. Um, and especially this time of year, yearly predictions you're going to see coming out from every news outlet, organization, magazine, prognosticator, you know, year in review, Spotify wrapped, what's ahead for next year, um, you know, regardless of how accurate or outlandish they are. Honestly, the hotter the take, probably the more eyeballs and clicks it's going to get. And full disclosure, Rochelle and I reserve the right to be wrong with these predictions. We're going to about make. all of them, basically. Yeah. Do not mm-hmm. take this as financial advice. If, if I was a betting man, I would take the under on the number of these predictions that will hold true. Um, and yeah, so we're most likely going to be wrong w- with these predictions, but that's okay. And honestly, you shouldn't even be listening to this episode if you're trying to like take these predictions seriously. But you know why you are? You either really like hearing the sounds of Rochelle and my voices, um, or you're listening to an episode about future predictions because you're a human and humans crave certainty. Uncertainty does not sit well with our species. You know, that's why news stations roll out their talking heads to make predictions on what's going to happen next and why you'll see countless news articles and blog posts, you know, in, in the weeks, you know, leading up to this episode and in the weeks following this episode about, you know, 2024 predictions or what, what can we expect in the next five, 10 years, et cetera. I mean, heck, every single quarter, financial analysts predict what next quarter's earnings are going to be for all the publicly traded companies out there. And people actually make stock trades based on this information, you know, what someone else thinks someone else is going to do. Um, it, it, it's kind of crazy when you really think about it. But uh, like I said, today we're going to have some fun with it and we're going to take our best guess on some things that we think might happen in the short term, medium term, and even long term future. Some will be boring. Some will be, well, duh, that's probably likely to happen. May not happen though. Um, others might seem kind of out there, the, the quote unquote hot takes, if you will. But uh, I bet if you listen to this episode a year from now, five years, 10 years, 30 years from now, you'll, you'll probably think we're idiots, um, but that's okay. Uh, you know, we're, we're just taking, in some cases, our, edu- our best educated guess on what we think might happen uh, based on the information available today. And with others, we're just putting minimal thought into it, throwing something out there and seeing if it'll stick. Absolutely. I do love with like earnings projections and things like that, that, you know, we have these projections and then you have a whole bunch of trades happen. And then three months later, companies release what actually happened. And then there's a whole bunch of trades based on that, on like what the reality actually was. And there's so much back and forth and up and down in financial markets just based on predictions and then reality, which is what we come back to eventually, because, you know, eventually we know if things are true or not, or if we were wrong or correct. And this is extends beyond finances. I mean, you look mm-hmm. at sports, you know, there are literally cha- TV channels dedicated to, you know, gambling, betting predictions, you know, what team's going to win whole TV shows, what team's going to win this week, music, TV shows like, oh, when's the next season of, of XYZ show going to come out, you know, here, get the latest tips on release dates and and whatnot. So we just, we, we want to know what's going to happen in the future. We, we don't, I mean, fantasy football is literally a game that was developed where you're trying to guess exactly what every single player on every single team is going to do each week in the NFL, which is insane. Like, (laughs) and obviously everyone knows that they're not going to be exactly right, but they're trying to get it as correct as possible, you know, and, and make, good choices based on what they don't know. Yeah. Well, without further ado, let's let's dive in. We've organized this by time horizon, short term, medium term, long term. Um, and do you want to go back and forth one to one? Or yeah. do you want me to just read through the three I have here for the short read term? Read through or? your short term ones and then all I'll right. go through I my guess we'll go one by one through. and we can we can comment <laughs> and, on each one. So all right. Um Despite many prognosticators predicting a recession in 2024, I don't think we're going to have one. Um, 
I think the market's going to have a pretty strong year, actually, and we'll probably hit a new all-time high in U.S. stocks. Previous high was January 2022, I believe, for the S&P 500. So by the time you hear this, it'll be, unless we have a fantastic December, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, it's going to be over two years before we we hit a new all-time high. Um, don't know when it'll happen. Don't know if it'll happen. I'm just guessing it's going to happen next year. Could be wrong, but that's my guess. Um, many people also expect there to be some rate cuts next year, which you know, if we go into a recession, you would you would expect. But again, I, I think the economy is going to be strong. Stock market's going to be strong. I don't think there's going to be a need for the Fed to cut rates. Um, I, they might, uh, but I don't think we're going to see more than a couple quarter point rate cuts. I think you know there's kind of two scenarios where where we could see the Fed cut interest rates, and that's proactive, mild cuts to try and keep the economy humming along, um, or the reactive cuts in response to things going south. Let's cut rates to try and stimulate the economy. I don't think we're going to need to be stimulating the economy next year. Again, could be wrong, but um, but but wouldn't it be surprised if we see a couple mild, minor rate cuts uh, just to just to keep the party going? Yeah, I'll jump in here too. I think you're right, Corey. That I, I don't think there's necessarily going to be a big recession next year. Um, and I think in general, when we try to predict when the next recession is going to happen, like you can have a whole bunch of different super smart people look at all of the same data and come to different conclusions about what is going to happen. And some of them will be right and some of them will be wrong. And really it's luck, I th I think, more than anything else. And I don't want to diminish like what they do and these people are really smart. And I think that it makes sense to try to find some clarity, but it's really challenging because there's a lot of things that you can't predict. So, you know, we can take all of these things that we know, but there's inherently a piece that we don't know. So, you know, we're in the game of making predictions today anyway. So I will say that next year, I think will be fairly modest. You know, like we may see some acceleration in job loss and unemployment with interest rates getting higher and companies have a hard, harder time like making profits and things like that. But I think that hopefully it'll be at modest enough levels that it doesn't really add up to a recession. Like maybe we see like a very slight retraction, but not big enough to actually call it a recession. I also think that student loan payments resuming, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a bigger impact on spending and retail sales and things like that than people really realize or have thought through. So I think that's one thing that will be a little bit of a detractor for the economy. But then I do think we'll see some modest decreases in interest rates, but nothing dramatic. You know, I think it'll be really, really hard for folks sitting on like higher interest rate mortgages to decide like, ooh, do we refinance? Do we not refinance? I think there's going to be a lot of conversations like that because that that's a kind of decision that we're trying to make based on information we don't have. Like what's going to happen next? Because if rates are going to go down dramatically in the next few months, it's not the right time to refinance. But, you know, if this is the best it's going to get, it is a good time to refinance. But we don't know those things. So it can be really challenging to make those kinds of decisions. Yeah, we've got a, a couple more housing thoughts to come in this episode, but mm -hmm. um, sticking with the recession theme, and this isn't a, by any means a, a an out there take. This, if you just look through history, this is pretty much accurate all the time. The next recession, it's going to be caused by something we don't see coming. Um, you know, might not be in the short term, but whenever that next recession is. You know, if we get like a mild, oh, unemployment rose by 1%, I don't know if that's necessarily a, a real recession, but like the next legit recession, it, it, we're going to be blindsided by something, you know, 9-11, COVID, you know, the, the great financial crisis, no one saw that one coming. Uh, it's going to be something that we can't, you know, foresee, because if we can foresee it, we can plan ahead, we can sidestep it. You know, if you're a, a running back on the football field, and the tackler is coming straight at you, you can juke him right or left and, and get out of the way. It's, you know, it's the one coming from the side or behind that you don't see that tackles you. So, um, so yeah, try not, you know, I, I wouldn't spend too much time trying to predict the, you know, what's going to get you because it's probably gonna be something you don't think of, like Carl Richard says it best. Risk is what's left over after you think you've thought of everything. So do your best. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's the things that, that, that you don't see that get you. And that's why it's important to have an emergency reserve insurances, you know, things like that. 
um, live below your means so you can afford to to take some blows and survive. You had one more short term prediction, Corey. This is I do. not something I want to think about. No, we'll just gloss over this one really quickly. But 2024 election year, people are going to lose their minds in the back <laughs> half of 24 over the election. Yeah. I would suggest turning off your social media. Don't watch the news. Um, good news about election season is there's plenty of different sports you can watch. So we got <laughs> baseball playoffs, football, hockey, basketball starting up, um, tennis, golf, F1, whatever you're into, go for a walk, learn to cook, you know, just don't pay attention. I'm sorry. Yeah. You, I mean, you can be informed without having the news on all the time. Correct. That's for sure. <laughs> But yeah, I do think that people sometimes conflate elections and politics and things like that with economic policy, economic success, the stock market, and they're not necessarily related as much as you think they are, which is interesting. Um, That being said, it could make things a little more exciting in the stock market because when Donald Trump was was president, you know, he could say one thing on Twitter and the stock market would go 3% and it didn't matter if it had any reality behind it, like you'd see these huge swings just by people opening up their mouths. So it might, it might make for some interesting volatility in the back half of the 20 of 2024. So we'll kind of see what happens there. There we go. Let's see more medium term predictions. So my guess is it's going to become increasingly difficult over time to pick winners in the stock market. Um, making diversification that much more important. You know, with the digital information age we're in, information moves so rapidly. You know, and then AI is becoming more prevalent. Like it, 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 the amount of time anyone will have a competitive advantage is going to be increasingly finite, and and those competitive advantages are, are more or less going to disappear pretty quickly, uh, making it really hard to sustain. You know that competitive advantage for a while and ultimately outperform the market as a whole. Um, you, know, you just look at the lifespan of publicly traded companies. Yeah, I mean, they're just going to become increasingly shorter right now. You know, it's uh, the average is about 11 years for publicly traded stocks um, for how long they're traded on the market. That doesn't mean the company only survives 11 years. You know, they were probably a private company for a while, went public, and then maybe they get acquired, merged, taken private, et cetera. But I think that's probably going to be increasingly short as some of the smaller companies look to, you know, get acquired by larger companies. Um, and, uh, you know, I think you're kind of seeing it already where, and this has kind of been true throughout history, but it's even more concentrated now, but the majority of the returns in the market are driven by a handful of companies. Like this year in the S&P 500, seven companies are up about 100%. The other 493 are up about 3% as of end of November when we're recording this. Um, you know, so you, you got you know, going back to the sports analogy, you know, LeBron James, he's the reason you, you succeed on your team, not the other guys that are on the team. You know, it's the one guy who's, who's delivering all the results. Um, so I think we're going to see just more of that, more concentration where, you know, a handful of companies, you know, are, are driving the majority of the returns, but which companies those are, who knows? You know, if you go look back 10, 20 years ago, that and just Google 10 largest companies in the U S stock market, it's a different 10 than you see today. I think the only one that's consistent is Microsoft. Yeah. Um, so they're an outlier. There's going to be as, as crazy as it sounds, you know, you can't today sitting here right now, we can't envision Apple, Amazon, Google, Netflix, Facebook, you know, going anywhere, but I can, I'd be willing to bet that, you know, 20 years from now, some of those companies either don't exist anymore or they're a shell of their former selves or they've merged or been acquired by the new cool thing. Uh, we just don't know what that's going to look like in the future, which again makes it so hard to predict. So, you know, be diversified. Try not to, you know, put all your eggs in one basket. Absolutely. One other thing that I think will happen in kind of the medium term, kind of the short term, is that the the tax breaks that were built into the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are set to expire in 2025. I find it really hard to believe that Congress is going to do anything to change that. And I mean, and I could be wrong. Again, we're making predictions. We don't know if we're going to be right. But I do think that tax rates will increase after the end of 2025. And it's not dramatic, but it's enough to kind of make a difference. 
Um, and so that may affect how people are evaluating their spending and their savings, you know, how much they're able to put aside, how important it is to set aside money on a pre-tax basis versus a Roth basis and all of those kinds of decisions. Um, so that'll be interesting to, to see what happens there. You know, with the tax cuts and jobs that when that sun sets in 2025, does the mm-hmm. salt cap go away as well? Is that the estate planning one? No, the state and local taxes where you can only deduct 10000 when you itemize. I, I'm not sure, honestly. I think that a lot of the ones where, you know, it kind of was pushing that standardized deduction over the itemized deduction and making it so the standardized yeah. deduction was higher and the itemized deductions were harder to get. I do think a lot of that is sunsetting as well. Okay. And also there's the estate that'll plan. That'll benefit a lot of people, in, you know, especially uh, in yeah. the... People higher that, tax states. Right. People that listeners. have enough to itemize. Yeah. yeah. And then I think the other thing that's also sunsetting in 2025 is that, you know, the estate plan or the estate tax, the whatever, at the federal is level is doubled right now. Yep. And I think it will be back to half of what it was starting at that time. So what we're talking about there right now, if you're married and both spouses pass away, at a federal level, it's like $23 million of your net worth is excluded from your taxable estate. So for most of you listening, you're not going to have any taxes upon death at the federal level if you were to die now. 2025, that gets cut in half and it's inflation adjusted. So you know, for mm-hmm. a married couple, it'd be about 11 and a half million, 12 million, call it in a couple of years. Um, and uh, you know, for a single individual, it'd be six million is what can be exempted from your taxable estate. Anything above that is subject to federal taxes plus potentially state taxes, depending on which state you live in. I would imagine that will change at some point in the future. You know, like real hot take here: taxes are going to change over time. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a prediction that yeah. is, is fairly I'll, reasonable. I'll, I'll put money on that one: that taxes will change. I won't predict what they're going to change to, but they will change. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, Every time we get a new president, they want to change taxes around. But uh, but yeah, there have been periods like right now, this is, I think, probably the highest exemption ever aside from the the year about 10, 15 years ago where there was no exemption because, again, Congress can't agree on anything. Uh, but, you know, in the past, you know, there have been the exemptions have been a million dollars, anything above that's taxable. So I think mm-hmm. estate planning kind of, uh, you know, will become even more prevalent for for wealthy individuals if that exemption comes lower because then taxes will become a a much more significant factor in estate planning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think with housing, that's the other thing that, you know, people want to know what's going to happen with housing prices so that they can make smart decisions about buying now versus buying later. And that's really hard to predict, but I really think that housing prices will remain high. I feel like if that was going to change, it would have changed already. Like it's, it's insane that interest rates are as high as they are and prices really haven't decreased. Um, but that's that's the reality. And I think part of it is that there's not enough housing. you know. And if there's not enough housing, that means prices are high. It means more people are renting, which means housing when you're renting is also more expensive. And I think that that's going to keep happening as long as our population is increasing, you know, which our our birth rate's not super high, but we still have, you know, immigration to a certain extent and our population is still increasing, which means there's still more people living here that need homes and we don't have enough homes for everyone. And so it's expensive. And I think this varies dramatically from region to region. It's not like the United States is just one like homogenous area. That's not true. That's not the case. But overall, I think that that's that's what we're dealing with as a as a nation. And obviously, there are some places where the cost of living is still very reasonable, and it may be it may be more attractive to move to those places as costs continue to increase. Yeah, I think beyond just populations increase, I think the one of the biggest factors is just demographics. Millennials, you know, millennials are in their thirties or early forties for some of them. Um, and, and that's the stage for every generation in the past and probably in the future to some extent that where they start getting married, having kids, wanting to buy the house, settle down in the suburbs, et cetera. Um, so I, there's a lot of millennials on the sidelines that can't afford a house. And the moment they can, that's what's keeping those prices elevated because, you know, due to supply and demand, there's less supply than there is demand. Um, I'm with you. I don't think we're going to see housing prices decrease 
maybe in real term, like I could see them stagnating, especially if rates, mortgage rates, I should say, stay where they're at for a handful of years. Like I, I could see housing prices kind of staying flat, which means in real terms, inflation adjusted, they're going down. But, you know, in nominal terms, they're they're kind of just holding steady. Um and I think, you know, if mortgage rates stay where they're at for a handful of years, we're going to gradually adjust to that environment. And that'll just be the new normal like it was up until 2009. You know, no one heard of a two, three percent mortgage rate uh, like seven, eight percent was normal. Um, you know, go back and look at the 80s, 90s. A lot of people had double digit mortgage rates when they when they bought their first home. Uh, but if mortgage rates do come down in the next year or two, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a spike in home prices just due to all that you know pent up demand on the sidelines or people who are in the starter home wanting to upgrade to a bigger home and they see all right hey I can't afford a home at seven and a half percent interest that I want but at six and a half percent interest I can get that home you know let's jump on it um, but then you know if that drives housing prices up further that's you know we're back kind of in the same position that we're at so. Uh, but, but yeah, you know, even a 1% drop in interest rates, I think could, could really ignite a buying frenzy and, and, uh, and, and revive the now fledgling mortgage industry and real estate industry, just because there's not transactions happening. I mean, there are, but a Many very, fewer. very, yeah, a lot smaller amount compared to, to the norm. So absolutely, that seems very interesting. A lot of factors and variables here. I know. And I guess the other thing is, you know, if a really significant recession does happen, we could totally see a drop in housing prices as people face unemployment and things like that. But I think. Yeah, I think you'd have to see prolonged unemployment of pretty right. significant amounts to truly see a drop in, in prices. housing prices. Now, again, real estate is very localized. So like, right. you know, if the tech industry gets hammered, you could see prices in California, especially the Bay Area, take a big drop. Um, whereas, you know, somewhere like Minneapolis might hold steady. Like it, 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 So mm -hmm. it, it is kind of very regional and, and local as well. Um, but yeah, uh, like even if, if you look at throughout history of housing prices, like they're just even in big recessions, there just haven't been significant price drops for primary residences. Uh, yeah, except in like 2008, yeah, 2010. Which which yeah. you saw that for sure, but right. uh but that's like the outlier. Um, right, that's we have true. a once in a century recession, hopefully, you know, so you know, your opportunity may uh, may have passed for your lifetime for that that big decrease. Not saying it can't happen, very well could. Uh, but mm -hmm. I I don't think we're seeing a 30% drop in housing prices anytime soon um with the current information at hand. Right. So now we're going to come down to some long-term predictions, which are even less reliable the farther out you go. But I do think the one thing that is predictable is that things change. And I think that our world especially has changed a lot over the last, you know, 100, 200, 300 years with the industrial revolution and like tech and everything like that. Like our world is dramatically different from the world that our parents lived in when they were kids. You know, like it's already changed so much. I think the couple of things that we are going to see change a lot in our generation and in our kids' generation are different environmental changes, but also like demographic changes globally, especially as we get into our later years. I think environmental changes are going to have a big effect both nationally, but more probably globally, where there's less financial security and less ways to deal with those environmental impacts. I think that's going to be huge and it's probably going to lead to some global instability too. Just, you know, when people are less secure in their own well-being because of these things that are happening with, I don't know, I mean, just leading to food production issues and like water security issues and all of that kind of stuff. Like I, it will be a big deal. Absolutely. The other thing is that, you know, most models predict that population like globally will peak late in this century, and then it will start to decline. And we've built almost our entire economic system on the idea that GDP growth is a good thing and is what drives success, you know, and I think that our way of looking at that will change a lot, but it, it will be different. You know, there'll be less people 
working and innovating and consuming, but technology is going to change also. And so I think that it's so hard to predict exactly what's going to happen, especially with technological changes, because no one could have predicted 50 years ago that we would be where we are right now. Like it's, it's insane. And that, uh, like, sorry, I was on mute. So the world you were 50 on mute. Yeah. <laughs> years from now isn't like, it's not going to look anything like the world today. And, and the things that will exist in, at that point in time, like no one could really even imagine them currently, just the way innovation works, you know, something that someone creates now that they don't really see a practical use for someone else takes it, tinkers with it. Someone else takes that, you know, adds to it. And now voila, we have this magical device that everyone uses. Um, you know, like 50 years ago, who would have ever thought of smartphones in your pocket? It's like incomprehensible. So, you know, I think that's a pretty good prediction, um, on the environmental front. And, and I, I hate that like pretty much every single topic now somehow becomes politicized. You mentioned the environment, half of the population is like rooting for you. Half of the population thinks you're nuts, but I, I try to remove your personal beliefs, political opinions, et cetera, from the equation and just look at the data and and the facts. Like you can't get home insurance in California or Florida right now due to climate changes and environmental impacts. Companies are like, hey, this is not worth the risk to us. We're seeing too many wildfires, too many hurricanes, et cetera. Like we're not going to insure your house because this is a real risk. We have the data, we have the calculations. It's it's not economically a viable business for us. And I think you're going to see more and more of things of that nature that do create a real economic challenge for for people and industries but i also think that'll spawn opportunities you know for for companies to innovate and like you mentioned water shortages rochelle i could see you know desalinization becoming more prevalent all right but we can't you know tap into our rivers and streams and aquifers because they've been depleted but hey there's a big ocean if we can remove the salt water from it economically we can deliver water to billions of people so there's like all sorts of innovative opportunities for new industries to evolve for 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 companies to shift um you know how they're how they're doing business and, and therefore opportunities for investors to benefit in the long run as a result by investing in those places yeah yeah, it's really interesting. It's hard to predict and we'll see what happens over time. But I do think in terms of like the economy and things like that, I think the stock market is still going to be a great tool for long-term investors. But I I do think our expectations of what we get out of the stock market may shift over a really long period of time. You know, like maybe we don't get the same kinds of dividends that we're getting right now. Maybe our PE ratios are going to shift to so that they're higher. And a PE ratio, we've talked about this in previous episodes, but it's basically like the price you pay for the earnings that you get from that company, like the price that you pay per the earnings that they that are generated. And, you know, we have lots of tech companies that have really high PE ratios where their earnings and what we pay for a share of stock don't line up with what we historically would expect. And yet people are still willing to pay that price for that stock. And so the, the stock price appreciation itself is what you're looking for. You're looking to buy a share of stock and then sell it at a higher price later. And that's how you make money. And I do think that all of this is built on the idea that we as humans have decided that these shares of stock have value. And so it's basically, you know, whatever you can agree upon with a, a buying and a selling price that's what the price is. And I think that, that that will still work long-term. It'll just be really interesting to see how like the underlying growth and you know production of those companies may shift over time. Well, to emphasize the reason stocks have value is because you're investing in companies that produce real revenues and profits for their owners and shareholders. So yeah, the, the the exact price of the stock is, you know, a negotiation between a buyer and a seller what they think is a fair price for that transaction, but there is intrinsic value in what you're investing in because there are real services, real goods, real profits, real, you know, you know, the the physical branch, the the buildings, the real estate, the products, etc., the materials that those companies own, you know, so there is real value in those things. Um, and, and I'm highly confident stocks will still be 
the best place for the majority of people to grow their wealth over time. The barriers to entry have basically been removed. Anyone can invest in the stock market now. You know, even with as little as a couple dollars, you can buy fractional shares on some of those apps. Um, there's like zero trading costs, essentially, um, which, you know, go back 50 years ago, 70 years ago, talk to someone about investing in stocks. Like during the 1920s, when we had, you know, the first, you know, leading up to the the Great Depression, when the stock market crashed, only two and a half percent of people owned stocks at that point in time. Um, so, it was, you know, it was a really small percentage of people that were affected by the stock market crash, mostly the wealthy, you know, is then, you know, the 20% unemployment that, that, that really hurt the overall economy. Nowadays, I think it's like 60% of people own stocks or some, adults, I should say. Um, you know, it's a much larger percentage of people who own stocks, which makes sense that PE ratios would shift just because there's a, such a larger number of, of people buying those shares. So they're your supply and demand, you're going to have to pay more when there's more people wanting to buy. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm still pretty confident companies are really good at making money. Publicly traded companies mm -hmm. find ways to make money in good times and bad. Um, and again, you, you don't really need any, there's no barriers to entry. Like with real estate, for example, you, you got to have, there's a, a hurdle you have to clear to get into it. You got to have a down payment, which a lot of people can't afford. Um, now there are some, you know, online programs and apps where you can buy fractional shares of like real estate investment pools and things like that to make it a much smaller barrier to entry, but you still, you got holding periods. It's not as liquid, things of that nature. Um, so I'm still pretty confident stocks are going to grow over time. Um, it's not going to go straight up, never does, but <laughs> that's, uh, that's my guess. Yeah. I mean, it's what we've built our careers on, right? Yeah, to some degree, for sure. <laughs> um, a little more on the, uh, you know, gr you know, kind of dovetailing from the stock market um, to to what's going to drive that growth, um, and I think this is has been true in the past and will be and will continue to be true in the future. Envy will continue to drive growth in consumerism, and hard times or urgent times will drive innovation. So the NVPs, people have a desire to outpace their neighbors, peers, friends. You want to feel like you're at least as good, if not better than those around you. If you feel like you're worse than those around you, you either spiral into a deep depression or you find ways to improve your circumstances. And if you're at a level playing field with those around you, many people want to, you know, take a step forward and upgrade and, and get better than those around you. So that's, you know, that envy, not greed, but envy is what's going to, to fuel people continuing to spend money, buy bigger houses, buy clothes, cars, et cetera. You know, you want to come off, at, you know, we're trying to impress the, uh, the people around us. We're keeping up with the Joneses. That's just human nature. Um, unless we can rewire our brains, that's probably always going to be the case. Now the innovation piece if you look throughout history, a lot of innovations come from a need for something urgently or to have something better than what currently exists. Like just go back to World War II, like all the innovations that came out of that. We saw radar, electronic computers, the mass production of penicillin, flu vaccines, jet engines, blood plasma transfusions, and like even M&Ms, you know, they, there was a demand for a candy that wouldn't melt in the soldiers' pockets under hot temperatures. M&Ms were created and initially were sold exclusively to the military in the early 40s. Um, you know, Apollo 13, a lot of you probably remember watching that movie back in the 90s with Tom Hanks. You know, they, they, it's, they, there were some malfunctions on the spacecraft. They were losing oxygen. They had to find a way. NASA had to find a way to get these astronauts home, um, you know, on a limited supply of resources. And, you know, you remember that scene in the movie where mm -hmm. like, hey, we're running out of oxygen and, you know, we got to find a way to fit the the square peg into a round hole. And, you know, they dump a whole bunch of materials on the table. They're like, all right, we need to find a way to fit this into this with only these materials. Ready? Go. And that's and in times like that where your back's pressed against the wall, like all conventional wisdom gets thrown out the window and it's just say, hey go try stuff, experiment. Like we, we can't fail because we're already failing. Just 
find something that's going to make this work. And that's where you see some of those great innovations come because you know you don't have to adhere to the usual protocols of, of getting things done within a corporate structure. It's just just give it your best shot, think outside the box and see what you can come up with. And uh, I think that will continue to change and and continue to fuel the growth in our our economy and, and stock market and whatnot. Yeah. I disagree with you on just one. Th- well, I hope I disagree Go, with yeah, you on one thing. Yeah, please disagree. I like that. <laughs> I know. I think that longer term, like over the next few decades, we might start to downsize. Like, I, well, I, downsize I like here, in terms of population, our lifestyle, or? our lifestyle. Hmm, okay. I, and I and I mean here specifically because I think in in some areas people still have very little, but I think here there's at least you know a group of people who are like we have more than we need. Like we have more than we need period. And maybe this isn't the best choice to be making, like just consuming without thought. And I think that that, I think that that is something that like younger generations are doing a lot of, honestly, like just, Hey, I value my time more than I value money. I'm going to work less. Even if that means maybe I'm consuming a little bit less because like people want more free time and things like that. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's just like a little bit of a, a fad right now. But I, I'm hoping that it's a trend because I think that that's a positive trend for people if that is going to be a trend. But do you think the trend will be a mindset shift as, oh, so-and-so is only working 20 hours a week and only making 80,000 a year. I'm going to work 16 hours a week and only make 70,000 a year to show them I'm better <laughs> at this minimalistic life. Like, I, I don't know that that is an interesting thought experiment. I hadn't thought about that, but <laughs> maybe I don't, I don't know that that'll necessarily happen, but I do think people will be more thoughtful about the choices that they make in terms of, you know, working and buying and all of those kinds of things, but we'll see. Like, yeah, we'll see. Only time will tell. Yeah, we'll find out. Now, I do agree <laughs> there is, a, you know, people are putting more of an emphasis on the work-life balance, family yeah. life, free time, et cetera. And I think that'll permeate into the the corporate culture and environment and just kind of become the new norm. But I also still think there's that innate desire to drive feel the fancy like- Drive car you're, and yeah. Well, not necessarily drive the fancy car, but at least feel like you're- on the same playing field as your peers and those mm-hmm. you compare yourself to. And if if you don't feel like you're in that spot, you you're you want to try and find a way to to move up the up the ladder. So I don't yeah. know. But um but yeah, we shall see. We shall what, see. Do we have anything? Oh last one I have on here. This is just kind of an out there Demographic changes. So there, there's no debating the demographic changes are real. You know, at the current birth rate, we will eventually see our population shrink, not grow, because we're not replacing humans at the rate needed to be replaced. Um, yeah, I think there, there's expecting by the end of the century, we'll start to see the US population start to decrease. Unless, I mean, this could change. People could just start having more kids all of a sudden. You know, people might say, hey, uh, you know, the two kids isn't enough. I want four. Um, But I I, I don't know. Um, So I do like demographic changes are real. We're having, we're going to see a more aging population. You know, the number of baby boomers, people over the age of 60 is growing faster than, you know, pretty much every other demographic. You just look at Japan, you know, you know, the Japan has seen that over the last 30 years where their aging population and growth has stagnated, et cetera. But, uh, and then I think, you know, people will point to Japan and say, oh yeah. And their economy stock market has been in a rut for 30 years. I think now it's finally back at its, you know, above where it was in the early nineties when, you know, everyone was thinking Japan was going to take over the world. But, um, but I do think, I don't think of, in America, at least, we're going to follow that same trajectory. Yes, I think the population will age. There's no denying that, and and there'll be more people not working, you know, than there will be working at some point. But I think those demographic shifts will force us to become more efficient with productivity. Probably could increase employee wages due to less workers, you know, more, less supply for the demand mm-hmm. that needs to be filled. Um, give workers more, you know, options for where they can go, 
um, you know, drive wages up, uh, you know, and I think that in the growth in wages is going to fuel consumerism, which will continue to fuel the revenue for companies and uh, companies are still going to make money and, and investors in those companies will, will ultimately profit as a result. And I think it's important to remind ourselves that the economy and the stock market are not perfectly correlated. They don't move in tandem. So um, try yep. and separate those two. Absolutely. We have a couple of random things to talk about. Some yeah. off the wall things. Some like, off the wall predictions. Yeah. Like what? What are you talking about? So Corey and I were talking about this before the podcast, but one of my favorite dinner table conversations with friends lately has been about aliens because <laughs> over the past year, at least it's been in the news a lot. So I <laughs> once in a while, will just be like, Hey, do you believe in aliens? Which is the first question, which I do like they're out there somewhere, right? Like the, the chances that we are alone in this entire universe is pretty minuscule, I feel like. But then the follow-up question is always like, do you think they're here? Are they watching us? Are they among us? Like what's happening? <laughs> and I, more than half of the people that I talk to think that they are at least watching us. Like at least just there's some sort of monitoring happening, which I kind of think is ridiculous. But at the same time, if everyone else thinks it, like why not jump on the bandwagon? So long term, I think we're going to meet some aliens, folks. We're going to just shake some hands. Hopefully everyone's friendly. <laughs> Hopefully we don't overreact and, you know, do anything crazy, but. Well, if they're yeah. anything like humans, they will not be friendly. <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> we can we... be friendly. We have it in us to do be we friendly. Them, do we meet them on our turf or on their turf? I, we oh, our turf. We're, we are not there. technologically advanced enough to get not anywhere. No, I I mean, I know our current understanding of physics says it's basically impossible to get there, which is kind of what I cling to when I'm like, where's there Define there anywhere where there could be life. So like there. the nearest star is four to light years away, Corey, it's, it's freaking far. Like we like, and there's nothing, nowhere in our solar system that we think could have any sort of intelligent life forms other than our own, you know, like we'd have to go to another forms. galaxy. We have but... to go somewhere else. Right. And it's all too far away, but I don't know. Maybe they figured out physics better than we have. So they figured out how to get here. I don't know. I yeah, don't know. we shall see. <laughs> um, not quite as fun as aliens, but maybe a more probable prediction. Yes. Probably the most famous person on the planet currently, Taylor Swift. I think she's eventually going to transition from pop music back into country music where she started. Probably in her 40s is my guess. And we'll have a third act in her career, bringing it full circle. And finance related, she's going to end up on the Forbes 400 list at some point, probably in the next 10 or 15 years. So the Forbes 400 list is the 400 wealthiest people in the world. The current threshold is about $2.9 billion in net worth. She's already over a billion. I think she grew what her, this current tour she's made like one and a half billion or something in she's revenue. She's pretty good at giving money away too. So we'll yeah. see, you know, if she continues to build her net worth. Yeah, true. She could just yeah. give it all away, but, yeah. uh, but I mean, I could see like, you know, expanding to a music empire. She just buys Spotify and owns them or Apple Music or whatever. Not Apple yeah. Music. They're too big. But uh, yeah, the opportunities are endless. Uh, endless there. Mm -hmm. so, Swifties, watch out. <laughs> She's a powerhouse. <laughs> that, an understatement. Yeah. That's Thank all we got. Thank you for listening. Yep. All right. Have a good one. See ya.